All right, so as I said, we're going to be talking a lot about building relationships, um, and classroom management actually starts with building relationships. You cannot establish authority in your classroom without showing the students that you care about them. Um, and that also applies to your co-teachers. You have to be on the same page with the people that you work with in the classroom in order for there to be consistency um, with your expectations. And so building relationships between you and the other people that you work with is also very important because you need to be able to rely on each other and know that you're on the same page. Um, so showing your students that you care is obviously going to be a huge uh, stepping stone there. Um, so get to know them. Let them get to know you. What do they like? What do they dislike? Um, a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about, um, you have to individualize for the students. Not all kids react the same way to um, techniques or to the way that you speak to them. And so you do have to get down on their level and talk to them the way that they need to be talked to. Um, that applies not just to students, but to your coworkers too. Not everyone has the same communication skills. And so it's really important to get to know each other, to know what works, what doesn't work, what you need to say. Some people need to be extremely clear. Um, this applies to both adults and children. Sometimes you just have to be really straightforward, really firm with people, and that's their best communication style. Other people you can be a little bit more silly with. You can um, you know, engage with them in different types of ways. So the only way to know what's going to work is to get to know the kids and your coworkers. Um, and then another point here, setting boundaries. Um, so I'd like to get some input on what you guys think boundaries look like and what types of boundaries you would need to set with both your coworkers as well as your students. I know it's really early on a Saturday. <laughs> Don't mean to make you guys think so early, but anybody? Um, well, I think that if you're in a position of authority, you need to be a little bit set apart so that uh, that authority is clear and distinct. You can't just be the kids, I mean, best friend in a certain sense, you know, all yeah. the time. You have to be, it has to be clear that you are the authority. Yes, absolutely. So as a teacher, you are the authority of the classroom. Yes, you can be friendly, but you should not feel like your number one priority is to be the child's friend. Absolutely. So when we talk about being friendly versus being their best friend, um, some of the behaviors I see, especially in the afternoon when kids um, are a little bit more squirrely and they like to have a lot more fun, things like climbing on teachers, um, trying to sit on you when you're trying to do a lesson with somebody, um, those are the types of behaviors where you need to be really firm in setting boundaries with students that, you know what, it's really not okay for you to climb on me. This is my personal space and I'm really uncomfortable with that. And it's okay for you to say that to kids, to be firm with them and to set those boundaries is very important. Any other boundaries that we talked about, Deb? No. No? Anybody else have any questions? <coughs> Oh, and if you ladies can sign in, too, and pick up uh, some sheets. All right, well, we'll talk more about that throughout um, different scenarios that might pop up where maybe it was just some boundaries that needed to be set that could help avoid those situations from occurring. Uh, but I really liked this quote from Maria Montessori, and I'll try not to butcher it. I don't speak Montessori very well. So <laughs> um, let us teach them, meaning the children, therefore, with all the kindness which we would wish to help to develop in them. So when we expect something from our students, that's how we should be treating them. And I mean, it's the golden rule, basically, treat others the way you wish to be treated. And that applies to students, too. Boundaries are important, but that doesn't mean you have to be mean about them. You can be kind and firm at the same time. And to be clear is to be kind. And so being very clear and firm is kindness that you're showing towards them. And in hope, we see that reciprocal kindness back to us. All right, so um, once we understand that um, relationships need to be built, then we need to look at establishing classroom expectations. Um, so I want to go through and um, identify with you all some of the classroom expectations that you have with your students. Um, so Deb's going to be taking notes for us. And if you guys have an expectation that you want to share, <coughs> shout it out. If you tell them that you're not going to 
start something, finish it. If you start something, finish it. Can you... Um, like if they get a piece of work out on the table that they've never explored before and they want a lesson, to make sure that they follow through from the beginning to end. Okay. A lot of times they're too... They just get into their feelings and they're afraid to do something they've never done before, so they just want to hurry up and put it away. If the teacher sits down with them and follows through and gives them the lesson and goes through it with them, then they'll be more inclined to choose it off the shelf again. Okay. That's a good expectation. The communication to the children of what you expect from them from the beginning. So establishing expectations, yeah. yeah, just repeating those are very important. Like, Can you think of some specific ones? <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, just an example, um, making sure they remember to get their name tag before they go get snack or go wash their hands with, with their snack or little things that they already know, but there are some new kids, too, that or younger kids that don't know or remember, so... When the older kids don't do that, then the younger kids, you know, yeah. kind of trickles down. Yes. So just a reminder. Yes, we're definitely going to be talking about reviewing those expectations. Like that. So one of the expectations is wash your hands before you get snack. Yes. Absolutely. It's a good one. <laughs> we think of some more general expectations that we have as far as behavior goes. Yes, this is semi-behavior, but... Um, more or less if a child is engaged in a material and allowing that child to continue through with it without having another child come up and interrupt them. So allowing that child to partake in what he or she is doing. Okay. Because a lot of times other children come around and they interrupt yeah. and I think they get distracted mm -hmm. and they're being, maybe they're, they're eager to show their friends, but then the other child has then lost the focus. Yes. So, so not interrupting students. So what would be, how would you um, phrase that expectation for your students? To be respectful of their time and space until, okay. they're, complete, until they're finished with it. Okay, so be respectful of a friend's work. Work time. Work time. Walking feet. Walking feet. How many of us need to remind our students of walking feet? Very good. I see a hand. Inside oh, voices. Inside voices. <coughs> Hands to ourselves. Hands to ourselves. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let me make sure Deb's keeping up with us. Did you get gentle touches? Oh, no. I didn't hear that one. Yes. Um, using kind words to set a tone. Using kind words. Yes. All right, so we have listening ears and having respect for your classroom. Follow directions. Follow directions. <laughs> okay. The first, yes, the first time would be nice. <laughs> That's a pretty good list. Can you think of any others, Deb? Uh, I see a hand. I don't know if it is for everyone, but a big one in my classroom is sitting at circle correctly. Sitting incorrectly. I have kids in my room, and if they're not sitting where they're supposed to be sitting, then they're in each other's space, and fights break out very quickly. So yeah. I guess the expectation is to come to circle and sit correctly in your own space. And sit correctly could could mirror even like at the table. Yeah. So you know, yeah, four feet on the floor. Basically, just in your own. And space. yeah, in your own <laughs> space, not on top of a friend. Yeah. Not laying down. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Just 
respecting, uh, I think showing respect for the classroom. But okay. yeah, teachers, yeah, I mean, we could clarify that too for our materials, for our friends, yeah. and for our teachers. Yeah. I was going to say letting a teacher know if you need to use the restroom or go wash your hands so they know where you are. Oh, yes. Oh, so that's a good one. How do you want me to work um, Ask permission to go find yep. Or well, not necessarily ask permission, but to tell, because yeah. we never want a child to feel like when they need to go to the restroom, they can't, right. but to let somebody know where you are. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I mean, they'll have to wait. <laughs> True. Yeah, it's a pretty good list. Um, do you want to put that one up on the board for or on the wall for us sure. so we can see? So um, my next point here. So we're setting firm limits and loving ways without anger, lecture, or threats. So why why do you, you think I feel the need to add? Loving ways without anger, lecture, or threats. Why is that part important? So they can build a relationship with you and not feel guarded. Yes, absolutely, because this is about relationship building. And we want to be in relations with people who care about us and who are kind to us. And so if you're constantly threatening me to not do things, then I'm going to be less engaged with you. Um, classroom management styles usually fall into one of two major categories, effective ones anyway, which one is really, I don't think, effective, but it works most of the time. You can either lead through fear or lead through kindness and relationship. And so if you're doing these things, then you know that you're not leading through fear. Um, it can be effective in a way that children will be afraid of you, so they'll do what you ask them to do. But that's not what we're aiming at, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can do it in a loving way, setting those limits is being clear, which in turn is being kind. Um, so my next point here is phrase our expectations in a positive way. Now, actually, most of you did this. Um, a lot of my people who volunteered have been doing this for a while, so I think it comes more naturally. But sometimes we will set expectations in the negative. So um, if you start something, finish it, that is positive. The negative that somebody could say would be something like, um, I can't even think of the negative of that. Clean up your work. Clean, well, clean up your work is still. It just sounds kind of harsh. Yeah, I mean, it's still the positive. Um, don't leave your work out, or don't leave your work without finishing it would be the negative. So we have the don't and the without. Those are negative terms. Um, so if you start something, finish it, is the positive of that. Uh, wash hands before snack is positive. Um, be respectful of friends' work time. You guys made this part really hard for me because they're all positive. So, <laughs> um, Inside voices, uh, I hear a lot of times, don't yell. So you're telling them what not to do while you're probably also yelling at them. So how do, we want to phrase our expectations in the opposite positive of the negative behavior that we're seeing. So if you're seeing something negative, we don't want to tell the child to stop doing that. We want to give them the option of the positive thing that they could do to replace that behavior. Um, listening ears is a good one. So I need to see listening ears. You guys aren't listening. I hear that one a lot too. You guys aren't listening to me. You need to stop doing what you're doing and listen to me. Well, that's not really telling them what you want from them. You're just telling them what they're doing. So let's rephrase that and reframe our expectations to be the positive. This is the behavior I'm seeing, so what can I say to get what I want from these students and to be as clear as possible? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any other examples of negatively phrased expectations that they've heard? Or maybe that they themselves have said and they're realizing a positive way that it could be framed. These are all really great examples of positive. Nothing? Okay. 
but we'll probably come back to these expectations as we go through the rest um, and maybe add some expectations that through behaviors that we're seeing that we could start to um, formulate how to, how to phrase them positively. Um, so yes, as Corinne was saying earlier, we need to review these expectations daily. Um, just because you have expectations in your classroom doesn't mean that your students are going to remember them. It takes an average of seven times for a grown adult to remember something being repeated before it actually sinks in. So how many times do you think it takes a child to remember an expectation? Eight million. <laughs> so partly you're going to have to become a broken record. However, the great thing about this is based on the routines that we're going to establish and the expectations that we're going to establish, it's not going to feel like a broken record. You're just going to set those expectations at the beginning of each day or the beginning of each afternoon with your students. So that way you're not having to, hopefully, not having to repeat it constantly throughout the day. You might have to give a few reminders to individual students here and there, but if you establish and remember, remind them of these expectations on a daily basis, then it's not going, then you're doing everything that you need to do to ensure that they can remember what those are. Um, and then most importantly, we as teachers need to be modeling those <coughs> expectations. So if an expectation is to use inside voices and you're constantly yelling at students across the classroom for their attention or yelling at students or a teacher across the classroom to do something or if you need them, what kind of expectation is that setting? A bad one. <laughs> as blunt as possible, a bad one. <laughs> I like it. Yes. So just keep in mind that everything that you do speaks way louder to students than anything that you say to them. And that's really what Montessori is all about, showing something, not telling them something. And so you can say these expectations all day long, but if you're not following them, do <coughs> not expect your students to follow them. And then follow through when expectations are not being met. If you see something or hear something, a child's not using kind words, if a child is yelling across the classroom, or maybe even a teacher, if you see a teacher doing something that's not following these expectations, you need to address it immediately. Because when you let these things go, then it's, it, it sets the expectation, your lack of doing anything sets the expectation that that is now okay for them to do. Now again, go back to the top, you then reestablish the limit lovingly without anger, lecture, or threat. So just because these expectations aren't being met doesn't then give you the right to then yell at the student that they shouldn't be doing that. It means that they need to be reminded of what the expectation is and give it an opportunity to correct the behavior or to follow through with that expectation. Is that clear? All right, so now I would love to hear some examples of behaviors that you guys either are currently seeing in your classroom or past experiences that you might have had with students that could help shed light on how to establish these expectations. Yes. Pulling stuff off the shelves. Pulling stuff off the shelves. Standing on the table in my classroom. So pulling things off shelves and standing on tables. Sliding chairs around the classroom. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. Sharpie problems. <laughs> Give you guys time to think okay, about I'm all sorry. those behaviors. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking that's the top of the classroom. Oh, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> we do have to put them in context of age. That does make a difference. Some of these behaviors are a little bit more normal for certain ages. If you had a four or five year old sitting on tables, we'd have some probably bigger issues. Um, and then pushing chairs around the classroom. Yeah. 
Using potty words. <laughs> Using pot, literally potty words. Yes. Just calling people poopy heads. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. Inappropriate words. Yeah. <laughs> they really are at this age potty words though. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing work. Throwing work. <clears throat> Got more, right? Taking others' work. Taking others' work. Biting. Biting. Hiding work. Throwing work. So hitting. Pushing, hiding work. Sometimes stamping feet on the floor. Stamping feet? Like throwing a fit type? Yeah. Okay. Throwing fits. I'm sorry, I got hitting and pushing. And then I... Hiding work. Mm-hmm. Throwing fits. Climbing on like shelves, diaper like changer. Cl- climbing. Climbing. <laughs> Rough housing. Rough housing. Pulling toilet paper out in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Too much toilet paper. <laughs> uh, un- unrolling the toilet paper roll. Playing in the bathroom. Okay, that would go with playing in the bathroom. <laughs> That's a general one, yeah. Playing in the bathroom. Oh, I thought somebody said laying in the bathroom. Oh, la- oh <laughs> yeah. You don't recommend that. We're experimenting over at Black Falls that the little boys and girls will lock the door and crawl underneath. Oh, oh no. yeah, that's a lot. Well, that's, we can only do so much. Yeah. They do still use that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anything else? Tearing up books. Tearing up books. So not being careful with work. Okay, yeah. Misusing materials. (coughs) Peeing on the bathroom floor. (laughs) Little boys. (laughs) On purpose? Yeah. But yeah. Peeing on the bathroom floor. Peeing on the bathroom floor. <laughs> well, that only happened once. <laughs> Anything else? Not putting work back in the correct place. Is that something that you not putting well is that a discipline um, or is that just a developmental like they're just not remembering where things go if you make a mess <coughs> clean it up that's so, putting under expectations no under like the behaviors that the kids do so just back talk back talk yes yeah, and no. not putting things away or just being completely destructive <laughs> See, that's the one pouring water outside <coughs> in the water bottle. I have misusing materials oh. slash destroying water. Okay. okay. And not putting things away. <coughs> what is a good one? No, we're talking about the one-liners to deal with those. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's a pretty good list. I'm sure there's lots of other little things that occur, but these are general things that probably (coughs) happen not infrequently. I'm surprised I didn't hear running around the classroom. Did we not say that? Well, we talked about about it. An expectation. walking. Yeah. Can I move your son? What? Can I move your son? Yeah, okay. Me too. Okay, so I'd like to go through this list and talk about how 
possibly establishing expectations could help avoid some of these behaviors from happening. And then as we go through the rest of the training, the ones that even if you have established expectations and these behaviors are still occurring, then we'll talk about what to do when they do occur or even possibly some other ways to help avoid them from happening altogether. Okay, so putting stuff, oh, pulling stuff off shelves. So do we have any expectations that we talked about before that would apply to that? We have be respectful of classroom materials. I think a lot of these behaviors actually fall under that expectation of being respectful. So partly with our young, young students, do they even know what being respectful means? So how do we develop respect in our youngest children? Sometimes we have a baby that he just likes to pull the material and throw it. And so I start from him, if you're going to coach it, you're going to do something. Like pick him up and make it do the thing and put yeah. the, the block or whatever it is in it. And so he stopped a little bit. Of so you're kind of combining two expectations there. We're going to be respectful of our classroom materials. And if you start something, you need to finish you it. Have to do it. You have so, to do <laughs> so if you have taken it off the shelf, then that means that you want to work with it. Yeah. So let's he, bring it over he here. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to put that thing. He just went through it. I said, no, you're going to. You're going to coach you, you're going to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So I said, Mom, he was mad about it, and that's why he didn't do it. Now he marked everything. Now, now he knows how to do it. And, uh, yeah, she put everything out there. Mm -hmm. And now he doesn't throw it. I said, Walker, when he's about to say, Walker, you know what you're going to do? And then he just stops. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes they just. Yeah, and sometimes they just have a moment. and. Even with babies, you just set expectations. Yep, and work through redirection. <laughs> what would that look like for actually the staff trying to keep the younger students from working with Montessori work in the afternoon? Would they be able to sit with them for a minute to show them the work and put it back? Or is it completely a an off-limits situation in the afternoon? It's completely off-limits yeah. situation yeah. in the afternoon. So we're going to be talking about choices in our next section and in those types where the expectation is you can't work with the material, then we need to give them a choice. So that's a good point to bring up. It doesn't, that, that wouldn't work in necessarily all situations, um, but it would work if a child is just randomly throwing things. And if they have thrown something off the shelf, even if it is Montessori work, then the expectation is that it needs to be put away and that child is not responsible for putting it away. So we'll talk about, as we move forward, some strategies that when you get in those types of situations, how do you move forward? Linda, that's when they're just pulling stuff off the shelf, that's when I, I make them pick it back up. Yeah. And put it back where they got it. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, that's not, not what we're doing. That's not what is allowed in this class. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the proper way of wording it, but I think I use, um, we don't use that behavior in here or something. So how could you phrase that in the positive? <laughs> Anybody want to help her out? So we don't do that in our classroom. How do you phrase that in a positive? And give them the option of what they can do. So what do. can they do? Yes. So, so we are respectful to our materials. You can put that away. They, or you can work with it. Yeah, they understand like happy versus <coughs> sad. So you could say this is making you very sad. Let's make a happy choice and then show them what a happy choice looks like. Yes. That's good, yes, and bringing in emotions, especially at that age, the emotions, and um, we're going to be talking about building empathy in a little bit, so that would be very helpful. Yes? With materials specifically, if it's a time when they're not supposed to be doing Montessori work, then I like to tell them we can use that during Montessori work time. Right now we're going to do something else. That way they know that they can use it at a later time, mm -hmm. just not at that moment. Yes, that's good. That's a good option. And if it's an afternoon situation, you could even say, if you really want to work with us tomorrow, I can make a note for Miss Becca or whatever classroom you're in that, and maybe she can give you a lesson in the morning. Back to the respect, being respectful to things for the kids that don't understand what respect means. Mm -hmm. In my class, I have said, 
you have to be respectful to things or say they're being touching a plant and playing with it. Mm -hmm. you, I ask them, do you know what being respectful means? And they'll say no. And I say, be kind and gentle just like you are to your friends. Or like we have these little water beads that they would use in the afternoon. And I say, pretend to rainbow with baby A. <laughs> With them. Yeah, so you have to give them a reference of yeah. what that means. Yeah, That's so that perfect. Understand. Yes. So you're talking about just to give everyone else a reference because they might not know age you work with. Uh, are we talking about like three year olds probably? Yeah. Maybe even a two and a half year old? Yeah. Yep, that's perfect. Where your younger ones, you're going to have to do a lot. In all of them, you do a lot of modeling mm -hmm. to show them what that looks like. Um, with our toddlers, we use a lot of gentle touches. Mm -hmm. So the sign for gentle. In case everyone doesn't know, the sign for gentle is this. <laughs> so um, we want to show them that. Like in the baby's room, the baby eats a book all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. So now when we do circle time, I tell them, you know, like this is a book, this is a book, this is a book, it's a book, it's a book, and we love books. We love books. Yeah. We crack the book. So to teach them to, to respect the book. Because you're modeling consistently and establishing that expectation daily. That's perfect. Yes. Yes, that's good. And then especially with babies and toddlers, maybe they're teething and you have to yeah, figure out, is there a behavior behind that to where, do I need to give them a teething ring? Um, so you can also, <coughs> so reiterating what they should be doing with the material and then offering them an alternative. So we can't eat books, but we can eat this teething ring or if there's another type of teething toy in the classroom. That's perfect. Anybody that is, have anything else to add? In the ones room, a lot of times they'll take off like the Montessori stuff in the shelves, so I'll I'll try to redirect them by saying like um, like where does this go? Show me where it goes, and then like give them something that they can't play with. So. Yes. So engaging them, and I think it's really important the follow up that we talked about in our previous slide that encouraging them to help correct the situation. So whether that's putting it away or finishing it or showing kindness to somebody that they've hurt. Um, whatever it is, the follow through with that is not just you addressing the issue, but then having the child actually assist in the solution to that situation. So there's a couple of steps that you have to take when it, there is a misbehavior of following up with that. And sometimes you can't follow up immediately. Some of these behaviors do require the child to be able to decompress for a little while. Um, and so we'll talk about when, um, when it's necessary to allow a child some space and time to um, calm themselves. Yes. We have this, like one of our works, we have like a food tray and we have a paper plate and a paper cup. And we have, we, when we first like started giving them lessons on it, they started tearing it up. And then once we started throwing that away, they started getting angry because they didn't have the plate or the cup for the food tray anymore. And so it's showing them, because we replace it, when they ask for it, it shows them like they have to start being careful with the work and respecting Yes, them. and sometimes that is true. Sometimes the material itself needs to go away if they can't be respectful with it. And in those situations, we can word that you can work with this material when you're respectful, and then you take it away to show that they're not being respectful with it. Um, we have an unusual situation. I get to stay for the a portion of the afternoon, mm -hmm. but um, allowing the child to have a workspace, like on a rug or on a mat itself, I think having that boundary is helpful because sometimes we'll find work and it will go on the Montessori shelves and we'll just see little pieces in different areas when we come in in the morning. So just a lot giving, that's one of the reasons we just invite the children to either work on a work rug or using a table mat so that they have a space to go to mm -hmm. so it doesn't get Yes, and that's one of those expectations as far as the Montessori environment that we establish, the use of the work rug. It helps delineate the workspace. It helps uh, teach respect for the environment. It gives them their own personal space to work in. So that is one of the reasons we do utilize the work rug in the afternoon, even when they're working with basket work and materials or having designated spaces at the table. Absolutely. That's a good point. Um, 
All right. Any any other points on these that we didn't cover? No. Every one of them you can tie back to an expectation. Yes. And if you make the expectation clear and you follow through with the expectation, then okay. you'll see the behaviors drop off quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And they won't go away altogether, so there are definitely skills that you need to learn to help um, avoid these situations as well as work through when they do occur. Uh, so one of the next uh, steps that I would recommend you take is to lock in the empathy. Empathy, can anyone, well, I do have a slight definition on here, but um, help describe what empathy is. Validating. Validating feelings, yeah. So don't minimize a child's feelings about something. Or an adult. Nobody likes their feelings to be minimized. What else? He wants to relate to them. Yes. And help them relate to others. Absolutely. So by you showing a child empathy, hopefully we're instilling empathy in the child so that they can relate that to other situations. So I know one of the instances where I've when they knock into someone and they knock them down to go back and make sure that the other person is okay. Mm -hmm. Because their feelings are hurt because they feel like that they don't care about them. And so it's important that they show them that they do care about their friend and they want to make sure they check up on them to make sure they're okay. Absolutely. And I mean, empathy, building empathy will also relate to respect as well. So if you truly show a child empathy, then they can relate that to somebody else and start being more respectful as well. So what what we want to stress here is what empathy looks like and then how to do that with a child, um, especially we have an array of ages. And so we're not expecting to have these in-depth conversations where they understand that you relate to their emotions. Um, but you can do that in, in simpler ways. One of the things to recognize with empathy, it's the opposite of sarcasm. There is no room for sarcasm when you work with early childhood. They don't understand it, and it, it honestly will belittle them because they think that you are being mean to them. Even students who will laugh when you're sarcastic about something, it could be their insecurity. So you have older students four and five year olds who might start to understand joking behaviors, but underneath the funny that they are experiencing it develops insecurities. And so the best way to help them learn how to be secure in their feelings and their emotions and their interactions with others, we need to be sincere and empathetic towards them when they are upset about something and don't just laugh it off that, oh, no big deal, you need to just uh, you know, walk it off, all of those, <laughs> all of those uh, sayings that we were told as children, I'm sure. <laughs> They're really not helpful when you're talking about kids under the age of six. Because they don't understand that you're just being silly with them. Um, so what are some of the things that you can say? Um, we have some basic one-liners that we uh, can kind of repeat um, with our students to help them know that we truly do care. The important thing to know when you use these one-liners is that you have to truly be empathetic about it and not sarcastic. And there is a very fine line, and I think a lot of times we are sarcastic more so than we think we are. So when we say things like, that's really rough, that must be really hard, I'm sure that makes you really sad, I can understand how that makes you feel where that could easily come across, oh, that's really rough. Like, oh man, that must have been hard. Do we hear the difference in the way that that comes across? And children know they are so perceptive of your feelings and your emotions that if you're not being sincere with them, they're going to know. And so some of the behaviors that you might be seeing, you could inadvertently be causing because of your reactions to their emotions. A lot of us are really uncomfortable with emotion. We don't like when kids cry. It makes us uncomfortable. We don't like to deal with people who are upset. And you might think that you're really good at it, but take a close look at how do you respond when somebody comes to you and they're upset about something. And this could be an adult even. But being sincere um, when we see behaviors that are not acceptable. This is how we can lock in empathy with them. 
Um, so even when they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, like, oh, how sad. <coughs> you know how we made a really sad choice, didn't we? So you, you're in it with them. You're not owning their actions, but you're helping them work through what they did and what they could do differently. Um, with our toddlers, this comes out to a lot of things like, uh-oh. Um, I like to use uh-oh with him in a sing-songy voice. It's not sarcastic. It's meant to be like truly an attention getter, like, why did we do that? Oh my goodness, what's going on? Um, I, I know, oh my goodness is a, a favorite phrase of a lot of you. <laughs> um, and that's good, but it needs to be a sincere, oh my goodness, and not, oh my goodness, what are you guys doing? There's a huge difference between that and, oh my goodness, what is going on? I had a lot of expectations set this morning with you guys. Do we need to review those? And maybe you do. So rephrasing or re um, evaluating the way you say things more so than what it is that you say. So it's not just about the what, it's about the how. Both of those are equally important. And then um, what we talked about earlier about not minimizing children's feelings, you need to acknowledge those feelings um, without feeling like you must fix it. So it's not your job to fix the way a child feels about something. They can feel however they need to feel. That is okay, and we need to be okay with them feeling whatever they're feeling. What we need to do is if there is a particular action that needs to be corrected to work through that physical action and not be so caught up in make, fixing the situation for them. And that's coming back around to then they need to fix the situation, whether that's putting work away or helping a friend feel better that they've accidentally hurt. I mean, even when it is an accident, um, it's still important to go back and show people that we care. Uh-oh. Were we on this slide for too long? Okay, so choices within limits. Um, we can use choices in a lot of different ways throughout the day to help either avoid conflict from occurring in the first place or working through when conflict does arise. Um, so I love this picture. Are you teaching kids how to make good decisions? So part of the purpose <coughs> of us giving kids choices is not just to avoid arguments from happening, but to <coughs> teach them how to actually make a choice for themselves. What are choices? How do you make them? And how does that apply to your everyday life? Because, I mean, as adults, you guys are going to have to make tons of choices every single day. And if we don't learn how to make choices as children, that process for us can become very difficult, um, especially when the consequences to those choices become extreme. I mean, fortunately, as children, the consequences to a lot of our choices really are pretty minimal. They seem huge to the child, but from an adult's perspective, a real world perspective, they're usually pretty small consequences. Um, but when we learn how to make those choices and understand that there can be negative as well as positive consequences to our actions, that becomes easier for us as we get older. Uh, so we have some basic rules for giving choices. Never give a choice on an issue that might cause a problem for you or for anyone else. So what kind of choices would that be that you that you might give? Yes. A big one that I've heard before is when a child refuses to come in from the playground. All right, I guess you have to stay out here. Oh. <laughs> you can't, though. I can't, so. yeah. We, so it specifically says that. So only give choices that fit within your value system. That uh, That's where we're talking about there. Um, or state regulations or agape policies when you're here. Um, I mean, I use choices at home all the time, so I obviously don't have to apply to state regulations, but I do have my own value system at home, and I'm not going to give a choice that I'm not comfortable if they choose that. So another good one would be um, clean up your mess or you're going to miss out on recess. Is that a good choice for anyone? I mean, most likely the child needs to get some energy out if they're not listening very well. So when you restrict their movement because they haven't made a good choice, then that falls back on you. That's going to be a burden for you later on, and it's not going to be effective for the child. 
that one that I've had to amend is when they are picking out um, basket work and we'll say, all right, the student pick a friend. Well, if another friend doesn't want to, then that crushes the one that's not getting picked. <coughs> so how I've done it is, okay, friend, what are you going to work with? Who would like to do this work? Then that person gets to choose from all those hands that have already decided, I'd like to play with that or work with that. So yes, that so crushing is crushing a spirit. Yes, that is a very <laughs> good point. And that causes an inadvertent reaction that you obviously hadn't even thought would be an issue to begin with. So yes, when you're giving choices, make sure that it's not going to negatively impact anyone else or crush their spirit. <laughs> Anybody else have examples of choices they've given and quickly realized that was a bad option? Nope. I mean, at home I've made silly choices like um, you know, you need to get dressed or we're not going to be able to go to the store. And it's like, well, I still need to go to the store. So that didn't work out very well in my favor. <laughs> uh, so just think through things like that when you are giving choices. Um, we try to keep them as simple as possible, especially the younger they are. But even with infants and toddlers, we want to give very simple choices. You know, do you want the red cup or do you want the blue cup? We're going to talk about more, more of that on the next slide, though. Um, for each choice, only give two options each of which you will be okay with. So whatever the choices are that you're giving, limit it to two. We don't want to overwhelm them with too many options. Remember, they're still learning how to make a choice. So by giving them a couple of options, um, you can help avoid a lot of uh, issues from arising. And then again, make sure that you are okay with either of the choices, the outcomes of those choices. Um, and then if a child doesn't decide in 10 seconds, decide for him. Or her. Now, this is not going to be a thing where you count to the child. You're not going to be like, okay, make a choice. You have 10 seconds. One, two. You're not. That this is an internal time clock. So, set, give them the choices. We're not going to give multiple reminders about what the choices are because we want to help them learn how to make a choice. But if they don't make a choice within a reasonable amount of time, and we say about 10 seconds, because that you, waiting any longer, they'll probably forget what the choices were, and then you're going to have to repeat yourself, and we don't want to get stuck in that loop. Um, so if it's a simple choice, they should be able to make it pretty quickly, and if they can't, oh, well, you decided not to make the choice, so let's go with this. And then you need to follow through with that. Um, a lot of kids will test you on that, especially our ones and twos, as even sometimes our three-year-olds will still test. Um, where they'll then want the opposite of the one you chose. No, 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 I want to do this. And if you're not firm with it, they're going to keep playing that game with you. So if they haven't made a choice and you end up making it for them, well, I'm sorry. You know, that's, this is a bummer that you decided not to choose, but this is what's going to happen. And every time I give you a choice, you have to make the choice or I will make it for you. And that goes back to establishing expectations. When you're given a choice, you need to make it or I get to make the choice. So be very consistent and very firm on the follow through with the choices the child makes because sometimes the child will choose something and then they'll decide they want the opposite. Like, well, no, this is what you chose, so we're going to follow through with that. We had a, I can share a personal story, this Becca with Hartley, we had some major struggles with choices with her for a while um, with her snacks because she's gluten and dairy free, so she gets her own snacks. Um, and we realized quickly that we actually had to eliminate the choice for her with the snacks because she would be given an option and then she would not be able to decide and then regret her choice and want the opposite thing. So sometimes you have to recognize with certain students, giving a choice can actually cause more of an issue for the child. So it's, that's where we have to individualize everything where some kids do awesome with choices and it really helps avoid arguments where in other situations, giving a choice in particular situations actually makes it worse. So be aware that giving a choice does not always work for every child. Yes? So a situation that I'm constantly finding myself in is like a couple of my students won't know what work to choose. Mm -hmm. And so I will try to like guide them to a work and, they're, and either they're not ready for that or they don't want to do that, and I'm not in, always entirely sure of where to guide them and like how to make that choice for them. So um, sometimes it is giving them a choice of different areas of the environment. 
do you want to work in practical life or do you want to work in sensorial? And then maybe limit it, like they'll choose practical life. Okay, well then let's go over to the shelf. Do you want to work with stringing beads or do you want to work with sorting silverware? And I mean, along the process, you're helping them learn how to make those choices. And that's more of where that type of choice giving comes in because it's not that there's a behavior issue necessarily. It's they're, they're just struggling to learn how to make a choice. So that's where limiting the choices or the options for them is helpful because they, it's too overwhelming. And sometimes kids have a hard time choosing because there are too many options and their choices need to be limited. Um, so we talked about not reminding them of the choices and then make the choice for them if they don't choose. Um, and then just the example of how sad you couldn't make the choice, I will have to make one for you. Um, and give children and fitting in your value system. Sorry, I want to make sure I covered all the points I had. <laughs> um, all right, now we're going to break it down. There are two different ways of reasons, main reasons that we give choices. Uh, the first one is to share the power. So who likes to be told what to do? Mr. Tony, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, nobody else raised their hand, so I'm assuming you don't really like to be told what to do. Um, so giving lots of choices throughout the day will help a child feel like they are in control of the situation. We have these expectations, we have parameters within our environment, we do have rules that we have to follow, but within all of those confines, we want to give the children as many choices as possible so that they feel like they do have autonomy. They do have the ability to make choice and they do get to have a, an avenue to be their own person. So um, there becomes a point throughout the day that you have to make the choice for them or that it's not a time of the day where they get to make a choice. And so that's a good time to remind them, well, you've gotten to make lots of choices throughout the day and now it's time that we do what we need to do. Nap time, for example. There's not a choice. We're taking a nap right now, guys. So, I mean, if they're a napper, anyway. Um, so, you know, you've gotten to make a lot of choices throughout the day. Now it's my time to choose that it's nap time and it's really important for our bodies to get this rest. So we're gonna lay down and take a nap. That's not a choice. Um, but there's lots of activities that happen throughout the day, uh, different routines that occur that it isn't a choice. Now you could provide choices within there. We're gonna talk about uh, on our next slide to help avoid arguments. When there is not really a choice of what they do, you can decide <coughs> how you do it. Um, and then within sharing the power, freedom of choice within the classroom expectations um, and freedom of choice throughout the day for the materials they work with. So we're gonna be talking about routines in a little bit. Um, obviously with Montessori mornings, we know the kids have lots of freedom of choice, freedom of movement within the environment to choose the materials, the activities that they want to work with. And we're going to talk about in a little bit how that applies to the afternoon as well. Oh, and I just love this picture if you guys didn't see it. So the little girl is a response to a command and the little boy is a response to giving a choice. He's like, hmm, I actually get to think about that. And most kids, when they're just told what to do, they're not super happy about it. And then choices to avoid arguments. Again, I liked this uh, little image here. So you can choose one or you can choose none. Um, I give this choice all of the time if I'm offering a dessert to my children after dinner. I want five cookies. Well, you can have one or you can have none. How many do you think they choose? <laughs> uh, and if you're consistent with things like that, they don't even argue about it. They're like, well, yeah, I want one, of course. Um, or you could do, you can have one or you can have two. So whatever your maximum limit is for that particular activity or that treat or whatever you're talking about, give them maximum choice and then something lower than that. And then they're probably going to be happy with being able to get the maximum. Uh, so these are used for times when a child would normally get upset. You are still in control while giving choices and then uh, also trying to stay positive. So again, we're setting these limits and these choices in a positive light for the student. Um, so it's not, well, you choose this or you choose this. Those are your only options. That's not the approach that we're taking with it. It's, um, you know, it's time to come in from recess. Do you want to race me to the door or do you want to tiptoe to the door? So we can make it fun and also avoid an argument. What? No running. No. <laughs> Out to recess. They're, at, they're outside. I still get it, but. Okay. You know, we tell them that. 
Well, if we're on the playground. <laughs> okay, whatever. Skip to the door. Um, if you're having a child who just is really <coughs> refusing and you're right next to him, you can say, well, you can go inside with your feet on the ground or your feet in the air. <laughs> your choice. If you're going to get there one way or the other. So the point of these types of choices is the outcome is going to be the same either way. Either way, we're going inside, but you decide how you get there. You might also have to give a choice at nap time. Do you want to go to sleep by yourself or do you want me to pat your back? Either way, we're taking a nap, but you get to decide how that happens. It's time to go potty. Do you want to pull your pants down by yourself or do you want me to help you? You're going potty, but you get to decide how that happens. Um, this also works really well for redirection. So giving choices when a child isn't working very well with another child. Um, you guys can work really nicely together. You're both going to have to go find something else to do. So it's still a choice. It's still within their control. It's still within the confines of the expectations of the classroom. And hopefully they can help work through that situation versus you having to solve it for them. So at snack time or even at a meal time, if they get up from the table and leave, or do you give them the choice of should you sit down and eat or should I take your plate or how would you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to give personally that choice to my kids all the time. Oh, you got up from the table. You must be done. You can sit down and eat or I'm going to throw your food away. They know the expectation. They have to sit. And it's really, really hard, but I have had to throw my kids' food away sometimes. I don't necessarily recommend throwing their lunch away here, but we can work through other types of options um, within, you know, communication with parents, too, about expectations and behaviors that we're seeing. Um, so this is where becoming parent allies is really important for us, too, communication with parents about behaviors that we're seeing and making sure that we are not only staying within our value systems, but that we're staying within parents' value systems as well when giving choices. And that's where getting to know your kids and what works best for them is going to be really helpful. Um, so the other part of this is we haven't talked about timeout or sitting out yet. Uh, can anyone explain the difference between sitting out and timeout? They have the choice to come back and leave. Is which one? Which one right now? Timeout? No. What was the other one? Sitting out. <laughs> so I just want to make sure I know what the difference is. <laughs> so make sure everyone knows. So sitting out is they have a choice you're establishing an expectation with them and then it's their choice of when they come back. Timeout is you set a timer, you sit out for two minutes or five minutes or whatever it is and I'll come and get you when that timer goes off. Which one of those do we use? Sitting out. Sitting out. Yay, gold stars for everybody. <laughs> so when do we use sitting out and should it be an automatic go-to choice every time? No. Why not? Yes. It still kind of gives them room to do the behavior that you're not wanting them to do. Like, do this behavior or you have to sit out. They can still choose to do the wrong behavior and then their consequence is sitting out. But instead of giving them, like, two choices that you're okay with that both help you learn the expectation and set boundaries and stuff, it kind of gives them room to fall back into the negative behavior. Absolutely. So if you're offering sitting out too often. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so typically, like, okay, the example of kids who are bickering working together. My first choice would not be work nicely or you both can go sit out. That's not an effective redirection. Now, working together nicely or both go find something else to do still gives them an option to correct the behavior and maybe realize working together is not a good idea. Or maybe they realize when we're bickering about something stupid and we can play together. That's fine. Now, if that's ineffective and they still continue to do it, then that's when you step in and make the choice for them. Well, you both need to go find something else to do. So now I've taken two steps and have not talked about sitting out. Now, if the children still refuse to follow through with one of those, then you could follow up with, well, this is really sad, guys. I have given you a couple of chances now to correct the behavior and it's not happening. What's going on with that? then you can talk through the behavior with them. And if that's still ineffective, then you might offer the choice, 
Well, I guess that if you guys are not ready to make this choice, you can sit out until you are. But the important component with that is when you have them sit out as a choice, you set the expectation of what needs to happen for them to rejoin. Yes? During circle time, when um, we're redirecting, and so they're not disrupting circle, mm -hmm. but like they've been given so many chances, it just feels like it's a daily thing for us to send them to sit out with them. Even though they've been redirecting, we've gone through the you mantra know, of talking it through with them, and they're still choosing not to listen. And it's usually the same ones that are choosing to do the same thing. So my first suggestion when it's a circle time behavior is always to reevaluate your circle time. Is there something that's not engaging for that child during your group activity? And it very well might be that it's not that, but that would be my first suggestion is always to look at how can we engage this child more. Obviously, there's a reason this behavior is occurring. And once again, we were on the slide too long, I think. Um, so we want to work. All right, so moving on to transitions, and um, I have a couple example videos that we're going to take a look at. Um, so transitions can be a time throughout the day that a lot of behaviors do arise. Um, some of that is because expectations have not been properly set. Sometimes it's because kids are left to kind of sit or stand for too long while they're waiting for the rest of their friends to join. Uh, this happens a lot when you are finishing up with work and coming and sitting at circle or going outside for recess and kids are standing in line. You have to do something to engage students during that process. So whether that's singing a song like, I like the way that so-and-so is sitting, or just singing a random song with them, or reading a book to the kids who are sitting and waiting nicely, or doing um, like head, shoulders, knees, and toes at that line while you're waiting uh, for the rest of the kids to line up, you have to do something to keep them engaged because idle hands will find something to do. <laughs> and so you're just, ex just expect that if you leave kids to their own devices with no expectation for a period of time, they're going to find something to do. You can't expect them to just sit quietly and wait for everybody without being given something specific that they are supposed to be doing. Now, maybe older kids you could play the quiet game with. Ooh, let's see who can sit the longest with a bubble and duck tail or bubble and or spoons in their bowl, whatever. That's circle time. But you have to be engaged with them and give them something specific to be doing. Do we have any examples of uh, times where they find struggles with transitions or things that you have done that seem to work really well. Maybe funny clown. What? Maybe funny clown. Funny clown? What's funny clown? Where you basically sing the song and it picks the child and they get to go in the middle of your circle and that goofy and then when oh. they're done they get to go and wash their hands and they have the right to say no thank you and just go. Wash their hands. Hand. Yes, washing, yeah, sitting at circle while everyone washes their hands is a big time-consuming process sometimes that bigger your classroom and is. I've noticed that when I do it, they're all sitting down because they want to be the first one to go and then they'll continue just to sit there so they can get their turn and go. Okay. And I think mine is uh, transitioning to go outside after a side circle and a snack, just trying to get everybody's coats and everything on mm -hmm. without them taking it back off and putting it back on. Yes. <laughs> process it can be so some of these other things might help with this um, so we always want to provide a warning before transitions occur especially the younger ones but even older ones and sometimes specific students might need more of a warning so again needing to get to know your students and knowing who needs what um, but providing that prior warning sometimes it's a two-minute warning sometimes you need to get, give a specific child a ten a five a two a one-minute warning um, it just depends on the child and then establishing a specific transition signal. In our children's house classrooms, we use the bell. So during work time, if it's time to clean up or you just need the children's attention to announce something. And as soon as they hear that, we've got Pavlov's dog going on and they all look up and start salivating. No, hopefully not. Um, but if you're consistent with the type of transition signal you use, then that's an automatic response to them. And when you practice it regularly, which during orientation weeks we talk about <coughs> with our, our leads to use this consistently for the first few weeks to establish that this is what the expectation is. 
Um, now, do any of the teachers in the afternoon use this? A couple of you do. So my suggestion, if your classroom uses this during the day, you need to be using it in the afternoon. And so we can, we can talk about that when we break up into our, um, our breakout session when you guys meet with individual teachers. Um, lead teachers, this is a note for you, talk about what you do to establish transitions and then share that with the afternoon aid so that they can follow through with that. Um, and then giving instructions. So we obviously during a transition want to provide expectations of what's expected. So the, I love the bell because the bell is an attention getter and then you can set the expectation during that, that time. So it's time to clean up. Um, I want you to put your work away and come sit at circle. How many instructions did I just give? How many? That was basically three. So clean up your work, put it on the shelf, go sit at circle, right? Should I give that type of expectation to a one-year-old? Why not? It's too much. <laughs> they're only going to hear the last one. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're only going to hear the first one or the last one. They're not going to know anything in the middle. So it's time to clean up is probably what they heard or go sit at circle. So are they going to clean up? Probably not. They're just going to go sit at circle. Or the kids who only heard clean up, what are they going to do when they're done cleaning up? They're going to wander around. So it's not that you can't give that full expectation, but you have to know once you establish the whole thing, then break it up. So it's time to clean up. We're going to put our work away and we're going to go sit at circle. First, I want you to clean up your work. And then you might have to start wandering around the classroom and giving individual children <coughs> expectations. Um, so this instruction giving is very important and will help make your transitions much smoother if you understand child development and what age can handle how many instructions. So for our two-year-olds, we can typically expect that they'll be able to remember two instructions. In children's house, we should be able to give three instructions and they'll be able to follow through with that. But again, you need to know your individual students. Some students still are <coughs> going to retain all of those individual instructions and you might have to follow up with some of them. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, so now we have a couple of videos um, regarding transitions that I want you to watch. Oh, will it not let me click on it? I even practiced this. <clears throat> okay, um, so before we move on to instant forms, um, does anybody have any follow-up questions about the things that we've talked about, the skills that we've talked about, examples, uh, behaviors that we might have up here and, not, and still not quite sure how to establish expectations or what to do if these behaviors occur? Would a bell work with my age group? Absolutely. Bell. <laughs> yes. We actually have some extra bells at the office. I highly encourage the bell. I think it's a very effective strategy to gain attention. Um, it's my personal favorite. But I keep the light. <laughs> like, I don't like to put them in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's been an old time use strategy too. But. Yeah, but you don't have any windows, so I wouldn't. Yeah, it gets like pitch black when you flip the light. Here. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Right. Yes, Becca. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so in my classroom, we've actually added to the bell. The bell is the signal, but we've also added the three part. We do stop, look, listen, and we, at, during our orientation weeks, broke down what each one of those would look like. And it took them, I think, maybe two weeks to actually get used to that process. And I don't really even have to say the words anymore. When I ring the bell, the kids themselves will go stop. And they think it's fun to all freeze where they're at. And then they'll say, look. And they go, listen. And then we give instructions. Absolutely. So I, that is a perfect example. I don't think I made that super clear. But with the bell, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean clean up. It's an attention look at the teacher and now I'm going to give you instructions. Um, early on when you're um, when I've had a, a newer classroom I had to use it a lot as the tone keeper so to get the kids attention hey we're being a little bit loud we need to be using quiet voices in the classroom let's focus on our own 
Um, and then you, that gives you an opportunity to also model the volume that you want to hear. You don't have to shout over the classroom to get everyone's attention. You ring the bell to get their attention, and then you can talk in a nice, calm tone. We kind of did that in the two classes. We did ties and tears. So um, like we explained it like I look at our teacher and like you go around and like you can see everyone's eyes. If you don't see their eyes, then you like we need to mm -hmm. expect you to see their eyes. And then listen ears, like we would have them put their ears out yeah. like monkeys and be like, okay, now listen. And then they all would be like quiet. Did you have a any sort of signal to engage that process or would you just I say think it? our signal was um, like a song. I don't remember like if it was time to clean up, we would sing clean up, but if it okay. wasn't time to clean up, we'd be like, I think we do the light and we'd be like, Hey guys, and like make the announcement. Okay. So you still needed some sort of a signal to yeah. get their attention in the mm -hmm. first place. Uh, or we could yeah. clap our hands. It is, yeah. It is okay if, uh, for example, you ring the bell and then you can, everybody's going to stop and you can do a pause when you ring the bell. And you can say, okay, you have uh, five more minutes to, to finish what you're doing. Uh, so go ahead and work. And then we're going to, we're going to clean up. Oh no, don't mention clean up. You have four, five more minutes to finish what you're doing. And then maybe five more minutes after, you just ring the bell and say, okay, ready, clean up now. Yes. We are going to the for time. No, we are going to. So I would do that if your class struggles with transitions, if you need to give a warning like we talked about before. Some students need the warning, some students do not. So sometimes you just need to go around and tell specific students that, and sometimes you need to let the whole class know that. Um, I, I don't like to use the bell too much to interrupt their concentration. If they're all concentrating really nicely, then I probably wouldn't do that. But if you are seeing some disruptive behavior or just if you need students who need a warning, that would be effective. It's because sometimes they, they have more things to, to organize, you know, to be mm -hmm. ready to clean up yes. than others that are just saying just with um, know, with some beats uh, and know the task so they can finish the class on a little bit. You know, they know that they need to finish it up, yeah. It's true. And sometimes if you do have students who have a lot of work out, then instead of giving them a warning on the transition, you could just start the transition sooner. So if you know you need to be at circle by 1130 for some reason, don't ring the bell at 1130. Give them like a 10 minute advanced warning. It's time to start cleaning up. You have time to finish your work. Um, and then I'll let you know when you need to put it away. So it could be not necessarily like a total warning. It's a warning for them, but you're really just initiating the cleanup process. And I don't, I know if it's maybe just for older students, but I like to <coughs> let the students know what we're doing next because it's almost like a motivating factor for them to clean up and then come to circle. Because it's not just we're cleaning up now, but it's Mr. Shea's going to be joining us for music. Let's go ahead and start cleaning up, and then they know what the next step is and why they're doing what they're doing and not just they're cleaning up now. Yes, that's absolutely good. So you're establishing the next steps, the routine of the day. I would always follow that back up at the very end with, so what do you need to be doing right now? So it's, it's time to clean up. We're going to come to a circle, get ready for Mr. Shea. Everyone needs to start cleaning up. I just do it backwards. Mr. Shea is going to be joining us for music. So oh, now we're going to clean that's, up and that's fine. And come to circle. Okay, that sounds good. I was just reiterating <laughs> to always end with the step you want yes. them to take. But that's perfect. Any other comments right now? Okay, we're kind of running a little bit late on this live show. So we're going to cover incident reports later. Um, what I'd like to do now, we're going to do breakout session, but we're going to have a break first. I think everybody needs to get up and stretch. Um, so if you are a Merlin person, um, I